and we're recording. Um, I'm recording this video with a different setup than I usually do. I'm using a different microphone, a headset microphone, so apologies if you hear me breathing, if you hear my chair squeaking, other noises going on around me. I'm also recording this using the Xbox recording app on a Windows device, uh, so it's not, also not my usual recording setup at that end, so apologies if that causes any hiccups along the way. What I suggested in this tutorial was now we've introduced higher order functions, passing functions as values, returning functions as values, let's go back to the first tutorial and see how much easier that makes many of the exercises near the beginning of the course. And I'm also going to show you how this means that we don't usually end up needing to manually define tail recursive functions. Um, one of the higher order functions I'm going to introduce in this video, uh, fold left, for instance, can be used for the Roman numerals example, but it can also be used to implement the memoized version of the Fibonacci sequence much more easily. And many of those things where I was kind of showing the memoization trick for making things tail recursive. In practice, actually, we can often use things like fold left, so we, we, we don't have to think about things upside down standing on our head so much. But let's start off at the beginning. Now, the very first exercise I'd suggested, it just gave you an array and asked you to double the elements in the array. And arrays are mutable, so to start with, many students, you know, did a while loop over the array, uh, building up the, the elements in the second array. But in class now I've introduced the map function uh, which takes a so th this takes a function whoops let's hold that open so it takes a function from integer to something else and it applies it to each element within the array so we can say array map and let's start off using the case notation let's say in the case where it's x for any x that we might find, it's always going to be an integer because it's an array of integers. We want our destination element in our destination array to be x times 2. And so let's just save that and rerun the test and see if we go from 5 failed to failed. See if we've already solved the first example with a one-liner. And we have 4 failed. That one is now working. And I then showed you in class how there is an even shorter notation for this. I can just say in this case, that this is array.map to whatever it is times 2. And if I press uh, press run on this, I'm running the, the first step spec that should run the specification and for failed. Uh, so this first one didn't fail, so this first one is working. Now let's move on to the next one. And so here we said, well, what if we want to multiply the element by its position in the array? And again, I did this one in class for you. And I said how in this case you'd have this problem. You go array.map and we want to go, well, it times something, but we haven't got the index position into the array to multiply it by. And so this is where I introduced the zip with index method as a solution to this. It takes our array and it zips it up so each element becomes a tuple of the value in the array and the index into the array. So if we go zip with index, and now we have an array of tuples, and now rather than you know composing by command after command, we can just compose by composing our functions uh, after each other. So on that array of tuples, let's call map. And in this case, because it's a tuple, I'm going to extract the values from the tuple, x, y, and we want x times y. So multiplying the, um, the value in the array by its position. And let's press play on that. And let's see if we have now solved our second exercise with a one-liner. Three failed. That one's now passing. Yes, we have. So that can also be solved with a single line of code. Let's pop down to the third one. OK, we did that for arrays. What if we want to do it for lists? And, um, you know, in, in, when we were working mutably, we talked about, well, you could convert it to an array and you could do the thing for an array and then you could convert it back. Well, actually, wouldn't it be handy if we could use exactly the same trick as we could up here? And sure enough, we can. Arrays have a map method. Well, so do lists. I can just say that it's that list, map, whatever the element is, multiply it by two. And let's press play on that. And now we have two failed. So that's first three exercises all done with one line of code each. 
Okay, let's go to the next one. Matching letters. We've got two words here and we want to find all of the positions where they have a letter in common. But we don't want the letter, we want the index. How can we do this? Well, in this case, I'm going to use the for notation because it's going to make all my maps pretty easy. It's going to do all of those things for me. Uh, a bit of syntactic sugar there. And so say we were to get, uh, so, I mean, a string, you can kind of think of it a little bit like uh, an array of characters and you can convert it to an array of characters if you want. You can do word a dot two character array. Um, as it happens, we might not even need to do that. Um, so we go a in word a, Oh, except we don't just want the letter. We want the index position of that letter in the array because that's what we want to put in our tuple. What if we do our zip with index trick on our string? And so here it is, zip with index. And so let's go, um, let's just go a comma x uh, is word a, from word a dot zip with index. And let's go b y uh, from word b dot zip with index and we're going to want to yield something we're going to want something to come out in our output and if you're like me you will often forget which comes first in zip with index in its tuples is it the value first or is it the index first actually i'm pretty sure it's the value first and let's just have a look yes a is the character so the first one is the character and so what we want is we only want the cases where a is equal to b and let's put that in and this is going to um, translate behind the scenes into a filter with and we can say if character a is the same as character b then what i want you to yield is a tuple containing x and y and this now what's the type of this let's go and find out the type of this i'm just going to say val r equals that so that i can put an r down here and so R is an indexed sequence of our tuples, uh, but we actually want a list of our tuples. So we'd like to say to list. Whoops. And let's save that. And let's see if that works. One failed. So that is now working. And so using this for notation, we've managed to you know, reduce what might be a slightly complex set of maps and filter widths if you like into well it's just for um well if we zip with index that, that we'll get have an array of tuples and if we zip with index we'll have you know sorry a list of tuples a uh, sequence of tuples in fact and let's extract them out and in the case you know only filter them for the ones where a equals equals b and yield a tuple of the indexes and then convert that to a list um so you can kind of almost program a little bit more intuitively but you can also see how sometimes we'll dive in and we'll kind of get the um the the the, the type checker to help us to say well okay what's the type of that does that look like i've got the right thing uh we can use the tools at our disposal to help us uh see if we've got the right thing and then we've got the test to see if it's correct okay that's the first four done with relatively small amounts of code let's now zip on to this roman numerals now, in the iterative solution, I suggested that what we might start with was a sequence of the mappings. And I'm going to I'm going to do this. So, you know, a sequence of, well, what does this Roman numeral string translate to? To say that M is a thousand, but also to say that CM is 900. And so let's just do that replacements. And I'm going to use a sequence for this. And I'll show you why in a moment. But let's just put them in for the moment. So M was 1,000. Um, C, uh, sorry, D was 500. C was 100. Uh, oops, I need the comma. Uh, what's next? L, that's 50. Um, X is 10. V is five and i is one and so there i've got a sequence of tuples a sequence from a string to an int showing what how the letters replace but i'd say that we could do this trick where what we'll do is we'll say uh well we'll also actually say that cm is 900 and cd 
is 400 and XC is um, 90 and XL is 40 whoops and as IX is 9 and IV is 4 and I've done this in descending order so that uh, we can kind of progress through and when it's smaller than a thousand we don't need to worry about this and when it's smaller than 900 we don't need to worry about this one and when it's smaller than 500 we don't need to worry about this one so we could progress through the array of replacements kind of building up our string and each time we get, we get to lose one of the replacements out of our string if we've made the thing small enough and this is where I'm going to introduce you to fold left now I haven't introduced fold left before but suppose we have a list of elements. Let's, let's pop across into a sheet over here. And let's say that I have a list of, um, you know, well, the numbers from one, two, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Uh, let's do a shorter notation for that. Let's do the numbers from one to 10, okay? Uh, or if I wanted that, and that, that's it inclusive. So there they are, the range from one to 10. Uh, inclusive if I wanted it to be exclusive so if I wanted it not to include 10 I could you know if I wanted I could do 0 until 10 and that's going to be 0 up to 9 um, and is that going to play there we go uh, so until is a little bit different than 2 in whether it's inclusive or exclusive well, okay, we're doing a sum, Let, first of all. Let's do a sum. How do I sum the numbers from 1 to 10? And I could recurse through. I could go, you know, in the case, uh, you know, I could do this thing where I've got an accumulator on the right-hand side, and I recurse through it each time, dropping one off the head. But it turns out there's something that can do that for me, and it's called fold left. And it will progress across the elements in my list from left to right, and I give it a starting value. And if I'm wanting to start summing them, then before I've looked at any of the elements, my running total is zero. And at each element, well, it's going to ask me for, whoops, so sorry. It is going to ask me to pass in an operation that's on a tuple. So it's, go it's going to um, gi give me, if you like, the total so far and this element, and then what's that become? And so if I, if, let's extract this in a, using a case statement, extract it from the tuple to try and explain it. Total so far, and I, the, the, the element that I'm looking for at the moment, and if I want to keep a running total, then after I've looked at this element, my running total is going to be total so far plus I. And so if I save that, the, you know, it's done the sum from, um, 1 to 10 is 55. Now, in this case, um, that, that's probably not terribly interesting. But let's have a quick look at how we can then do the memoized version of the Fibonacci sequence for it. So we, what we want to say, let's say that def fib of i, where i is an int, and we're going to return an int, and it's going to equal, let's just take for the moment the list of numbers from 0 to i, inclusive, so that we can go have a look at it of i at the end. And let's do fold left, and uh, well, let's keep a running total of the Fibonacci sequence so far. Now, before I've looked at anything in the Fibonacci sequence, if I've got a running, to running total of, you know, building up the sequence, going the, the whole sequence, at the start, before I've looked at anything, well, I'm really looking at the empty sequence, and it's an empty sequence of integers. And then, at each step along the way, I, let's say I am passed in the sequence so far and the current number. And what I want to say is, well, I want to put that next number onto the sequence so far. I want, I want to return the sequence one bigger from my fold left. And so in this case, I need to do my i match here because um, if 
it's one, uh, sorry, if it's zero, I just want to return the sequence with one on the end. And if it's one, I want to return the sequence with one on the end. And if it is some other value, then I want to return the, um, uh, oops, so sorry, I had forgotten to say case. I'm being domestically blind again. There we go. Um, sorry about that. So case zero goes to sequence plus one. Case one, so if we're looking at i, then sequence with one on the end. So start off, I'll have the empty sequence come in, I'll hit this case, and then I'll get um, a sequence just with a one in it. Come through the next time, and i will be uh, one, because this is the second call, you know, the second one along in our list of numbers from zero uh, up to i inclusive. So i is now one, and I'll have a sequence of one come in, and I'm going to put a sequence of one with one appended at the end. So a sequence of one one is going to go through the next time. Next time it comes through, x is going to be, uh, sorry, uh, this is going to be the sequence of one one and two. And we come down to this case. And what's the next value of the, uh, of the Fibonacci? Well, it's the sum of the previous two. So I can just say it is the sum of x sequence of x minus one plus the sequence of x minus two. Um, except I don't just want to return the number, I want to return that appended onto the end of the sequence. Okay, so this is now going to generate my Fibonacci sequence from zero up to the number I've just called. And this down here is saying that, well, I've got a sequence of int, not the int. And so at the end, I just want to get out of that sequence. So if I go you know, value the whole sequence is that. I just want to say the whole sequence and get the element that was at i. And so now I've defined the Fibonacci sequence. I've not used a tail recursion. Uh, I've just used this fold. I've said I just want to go along folding from left to right and at each element into my accumulator. Well, I want to do this depending on what was in my accumulator before. And so let's just check that works. Fib of three is three. Fib of four is five. Let's go fib of um, 21 is 17,711. Um, but so hopefully, although I was talking as I typed it, hopefully this is a little bit more understandable than actually trying to put the tail recursion stuff in manually. So this is, uh, I'm saying I've got the numbers from zero up to i, and then I'm folding across that, and I'm starting with the empty sequence, and at each step of my fold, I'm appending the next value in the Fibonacci sequence, and that is defined by this equation. All right, let's now go um, go back to here, and let's see how this applies to our Roman numerals. Well, here we have a sequence that is in order, and what we can do is we can visit it and find out, well, how many m's do we need to put in? And then how many cm's do we need to put in and have a remainder that's less than 900? And then how many d's do we need to put in and have a remainder that's less than, uh, than 500? Um, so what we're going to do, we're going to go replacements dot fold left. Now, what do we want to fold across? What do we want to carry through as we go? Uh, well, we want to carry through, um, I'm going to suggest, the remainder, the remaining value that we haven't dealt with yet, which is going to start out at the whole number. And then as we keep working out the beginning of the string, it's going to get smaller and smaller uh, as we look at the look at remainder. So the remainder is going to start off as i, and I'm going to pass through the string that I'm building up. And that string is going to start out empty. OK, so that's what I want my starting value to be. Now, what do I want to do at each step along the way? Well, I would like to say case. And if you remember, we pass in a tuple and we pass in a tuple that has uh, its left hand value is the format 
of, um, you know, it's the same type as whatever we said the start was. So it's going to have, in its left hand side, it's going to have a remainder and it's going to have a string so far. And in its right hand element, it is going to have whatever element in this sequence we are currently looking at. And so that is it also going to be a tuple. So let's just extract that tuple straight out. And let's say it's going to be a letter and a value. And OK, I know these are two letters technically, but let's just call that a letter. And it says a symbol that we're appending. And what do we want to produce? Uh, well, we want to produce the string that we've got so far. Um, and we want to add to that um, however many of these we need to put in. And also we're going to have to work out what our next remainder is. So let's uh, let's say that the, if you like, the, the, the number of times that we can put this letter in is the, uh, the remainder divided by the value. The remainder divided by the value. So, for instance, if we've got 4,000 and something and we're looking at M, which is a thousand, we're going to want to put four M's in. And let's then say that the string to append uh, is going to be, well, it's going to be whatever this letter is, that number of times. And it just turns out that you can do that by saying letter times num times. And that will give you a string that repeats this number of times. Now what we work, need to work out, of course, is our new remainder. Um, now, if we've done this right, if we've uh, put in that sequence as many times as we can, um, the new remainder is going to be um, the old remainder mod this number. It's going to be what's left over from our division here. That was, that was you know, integer division, and we're now going to want to deal with you know, the remainder of that, the mod uh, of that. So it's going to be remainder mod value. And so then what we want to pass on into our next call is going to be where we want the new remainder, new remainder, and we want the string so far. Um, so we want so far. Um, and on the end of that, we would like to put uh, the value to append. And I think I've probably got that. Let's see, what's the... Oh, hang on, let me see. Uh, oh, what am I... Oh, gosh, I'm hitting the wrong buttons. I'm confusing myself because it's Windows. Many apologies, I hit the wrong button there. Let us go back here. So far as a string, to append, oopsie daisy. I have knocked out, there we go, I've knocked out some text here. That was what was causing me the problem. Letter times num times. How did that happen? So to append is now a string. So far is now a string. And uh, what do we want? How do we append the strings? Ooh. Let's scroll down and find one that looks right. Uh, it's not, well, yep, plus looks like it'll do an append for us, of course. I am being, I am being sleepy for a moment. Many apologies. Okay, so this is now going to complain, well, hang on, I've now got an expression of type int string because it's returning me at the end a type of this. But at the end, I should have, if you like, uh, coming out at the other end, I should end up with a remainder of zero and everything is in the right hand side. Um, so let's say... Let's just go zero comma string is going to be equal to that. So let's extract it and then let's uh, return the string. And let's save that and let's run it. Drum roll. All five tests passed. This worked. And so I didn't do a complex tail recursion here. I did a fold left across these replacements so that I could consider each one in turn, considering how many times do I need to add this string to the string that I've got so far? And if so, 
how much of my original number is left over to pass in to the next iteration. And so passing this tuple along fold left and at each call of the fold left, the remainder is getting smaller and the strings getting bigger until at the end, the remainder is zero and the string has my full number in Roman, Roman numerals in it. Okay, that was a bit long and mealy mouthed. Uh, so that is that one. Let's now jump across and start doing our Sudoku Sensei. Now this one, uh, I introduce a few extra things. I introduce, first of all, this idea of a type alias, this idea that we can take an existing type, a tuple of integers, and say, I want to call that a position. And I want to do that because it's easier to say, move P where P is a position uh, and get it right than keep saying tuple of indents. But if I have a tuple of intents, well, I think, you know, something like 0, 0,2, that looks pretty understandable, those Cartesian coordinates, that looks quite nice for our position type. So we've got a type alias where we have called tuple of two integers a position. And it is still a tuple of two, uh, of two integers. We can still do everything that we can do with tuples further on. We've just introduced an alias for it. Um, I've also suggested let's define a case class, and we introduce these in lectures, for a move. And so a move in our Sudoku is going to put a number um, into the grid at a certain position. All right, so we need a Sudoku grid. And so for our Sudoku grid, I've said, well, let's just do a type alias for that. Let's have our Sudoku grid as being a map from a position to what number's there. And that's going to be quite nice because that's going to handle the case that, you know, as we're developing our Sudoku grid, we don't have all the numbers filled in. There's not an entry for every element. It's not as if um, we ha are changing it from, you know, a two-dimensional array and actually at that particular point there was a, a, a null. It's actually that, you know, no, 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 there was nothing uh, in the grid at 2, comma 1 until we wrote the number there. So our map is going to be quite a handy little representation for that. But it's going to be a bit verbose to try and write out a map by hand to define the grid. So instead, if we scroll down, I have a function that I've defined for parsing in a grid so that I can write it out like this, so that I can write it out uh, with uh, dots or in fact any non-digit character as an empty space and a number where I want to put a number to start the grid. And so that is coming in as a, um, a big long string, but it's got new lines in it. And so the thing I say is, well, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go for x in 0 to 9 and y in 0 to 9. And I'm going to split the string so that I split it up. Um, sorry, sorry, I split it up around the new lines and I've got an array of strings. And so if I split it up and I look up, that line, so you know the y value is the you know, what what row are we in, and then that's a string, and I look at the character at a particular position, that's the x, uh, and if it's a digit, then I want to put uh, then I want to set that uh, value in my map to be that character, and I've had to do this odd thing. I've done two string dot two int because if I just do to int on a character. I will get the character code. So, you know, for one, it might be 47 or something, which is kind of can be a little bit confusing. But if I turn it to a string and then say to int, it will try to parse that string as an integer. And so that should work. And this here, this uh, nested for loop, because it is going, uh, you know, map and flat map on a sequence of integers, at the end of it, I'm going to get a sequence of uh, a position, a tuple of ints, uh, tupled to a number, the number that's in there. And so this is going to be a, to start off as a sequence of position to integer, but I can call to map on that to create a map from position to integer. Okay, and don't forget map of position to integer is also called a grid because we aliased it. All right, so I've done that and I've said grid one is parse this grid. And so this is my test Sudoku grid that I refer to um, in the Sudoku Sensei spec. And so it says, well, just check that, you know, grid 
one if I, and if I call get on that map so it'll return me something if it's there and none if it's not and just check that you know zero zero shouldn't have anything in it and two but two two should have one in it and if I go back here and I see that yep zero zero should have nothing in it but uh, two two should have one in it so now we get down to where I have um, asked you to implement the exercise. And so I said, start off, let's just take a function that given a position will produce all of the positions in the same row. And so we want to go from row of one to two, we want to produce all of these. And so what I'm gonna say is, well, a position is a tuple. And so let us extract the y value, the, the, the row number from that tuple. And then what I would like to do is say, well, for x is in 0 until 9, our sequence of um, uh, 0 up to and including 8 but not including 9, uh, yield me and I want to have a x and y. And so that should give me um, x from 0 until not including 9 paired with uh, whatever the y value was in a tuple. And let's save that and let's go and run sudoku sente spec and see if it works. And 2 of 6 done, 4 failed, uh, but rows happy. Um, the it's down you know column is the first one that is failing and that's because we haven't implemented column yet what can we do with column well column is pretty much the same thing the other way around um, but just for fun let's do it slightly differently uh, i said that um, the for loop is syntactic sugar for map let's do this one as a map zero until nine and let's do the map and let's say that that goes to um, case you know, y, whatever y was, and then we want to return the tuple x, y. Oh, I keep hitting the Windows key um, because I'm used to hitting the Apple key on my Mac. Let's run that and let's see if column disappears out of our failing tests list. And it does. Now we're down to quadrant being the first one that fails. All right, but for the quadrant, I've said that, well, in both horizontal and vertical directions we're going to want to work out what group of three are we in zero one or two three four or five or six seven and eight uh, we don't need to do any kind of higher order function for this we can just say um uh well let, let's use a match shall we and let's say case x if x is less than or equal to two gives us sequence of zero one two and case x if um, x is less than or equal to um, 5, um, we'll hit this case first if it's less than or equal to 2. We'll only reach this one if it's uh, bigger than 2. Um, goes to sequence of 3, 4, 5. And case, uh, any other case, if it's bigger than that, I just want you to return sequence of 6, 7 and 8. All right. So that hopefully works out which group of three our number is in. Um, but I don't think that, uh, that, that, that that's not yet going to do any changes to our results because we still have to do quadrant. All right, so for quadrant, we've been given a position. Uh, let's extract the x and y values from that position. And then what do we want to do? We want to go across, you know, the three... We want to return the nine positions in that quadrant. And so I'm going to say that this is four. And uh, let's say I is in, uh, what do we want? We want to get the three positions surrounding this X. So for I is in which three of X? And for J is in which three of Y? And I would like a tuple containing I and J. Let's run that. Okay, that one is now passing. So we're now down to two failed. 
Uh, so row, column, and quadrant, they're all uh, th these are all functions from position to sequence of position. And here I've just shown you this thing where you can, um, so we defined these as functions, uh, but I can also put them into, into a sequence. I can have a sequence of functions from position to sequence of position. Um, and I can do that by saying sequence of row, column, quadrant. Uh, but I do have to put in the type annotation because if I don't put in the type annotation, I'm going to find that it's going to say, well, hang on, missing arguments for method row. Oh, the compiler is interpreting this as me trying to call row, column and quadrant, and I haven't given it any arguments and it's complaining. No, 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 I'm not asking you to call it. I'm asking you to give me a sequence containing those as functions. Um, and now it's happy. All right, so let's define a function that can take a grid, a number and a sequence of positions and tell us if any of those positions contains that number. Don't forget, not all the positions will have been set in the grid. Some might be empty. You can use get or else key and default to return a, a default value. OK, so we've got some sequence of positions has been passed in. And I'm wanting to ask the grid, do you contain n at that uh, particular value? So let's say um, positions dot well I want to have a um, I want to see if this is true for any of those positions and so I can call another um, method called exists and what exist is going to do is it is going to take a proposition and it is going to take a proposition and so this is a you know because this is a sequence of positions a sequence of tuples of ints uh, it's going to apply my uh, it's going to apply my predicate across each value in the sequence, and if I give it a predicate, something that takes the, one of those values and returns true, then exists will return true if any of them return true, and so I can say um, positions if in there there exists some position such that the grid uh, dot and let's do get or else. Uh, well, let's let's um, let's in fact in this in this case let's just use get. Well, no, no, no. Let's do the get or else. Let's say get or else. So get what was the value at that position, and let's default it to something that won't match whatever I'm looking for. Uh, if that equals n, and so this is my proposition that the um, the value in the grid at this location that I'm talking about is the number that I'm talking about. And so if that is true for any of the positions in the grid, then this is going to return true. And so that should succeed. Um, the other thing I was going to suggest I can do, let's suppose that I just want to do a get of p. Get of p uh, will return me a an option. Uh, so if I see, you know, that's an option int. So it's either going to contain none if there's nothing there, or it's going to return some value if it's there. I could ask, does that value, sorry, does that option that's been returned contain my number? And none doesn't contain anything, so none won't contain my number. Some of some other number won't contain my number, but some of my number will contain my number. So again, that, that's going to be roughly equivalent, and in this case, I haven't had to introduce the minus one value for a default, um, you know, if nothing's in the grid, then use this value. Uh, so get grid dot if, you know, optionally get what's at P, returning none if there was nothing there, does it contain my number? Let's keep going. Let's define a function that takes a position and a grid and return what numbers could go in that position. All we're gonna do is take the numbers from one to nine and filter out the ones that can't go there because they're already pre present in that row, column, or quadrant. Um, filter is yet another higher order function that you might want to use the inverse filter not. So we're going to start off um, that by with the the sequence of numbers from one to nine. So this is you know to start with that's the possibilities. We're going to filter out the case where um, that number is already in the grid, uh, is, is already in the row, 
or in the column uh, or in the quadrant. Uh, so let's start off doing it a little bit naively. Let's filter not case my number and we'll say is my number um, is my number present in number present in of the grid that I'm looking at uh, my number and let's have a look at the row for my position uh, but that's only filtered out the ones that are in that row let's filter out the ones that are in that column as well number present in grid num column of position um, or number present in of grid um, num and this was quadrant of position so if it is in any of those I want you to filter it out and then we're going to get a sequence of integers back the, the ones that were not in the present in the row the column or the quadrant and we run our tests and we're down to one failed so that one is succeeding uh, so this is working but I said extra bonus not really necessary you can nest two higher order functions if you want if you do position functions dot exists and what I mean by that is this formulation that looks really similar I'm just changing whether it's row column or quadrant now up here I happened to create a sequence containing those functions row column and quadrant and I would like to return true if it is true for any of them so I could say position functions dot exists if it is true for any contents for any of these functions um, and I could use that formulation so let's do that let's do that uh, case num goes to we're going to go position functions dot exists and in this case so let's case you know um, my position function let's call it pos f um, goes to and what do I want to say uh, I wanted to say number present in of grid num and that position function on my position and if I delete that oops this should still work and it does still the, the the failing test is the next one that I haven't implemented yet uh, so there I've nested two um, higher order functions I've nested filter not and exist but arguably I would say that this is you know this is a little bit less readable this is asking you to think about that concept that we are checking within a sequence of these position functions and returning true if any of them return true it's a little bit convoluted and given that we've only got three elements in our position functions it's probably a little bit overkill I would actually suggest that uh, in this case you know this one is not even any longer it is still three lines of code and um, so in that case I think it is perfectly reasonable uh, possibly even more readable and better uh, to just leave those expanded so that it kind of does what you can intuit just from reading it straight away all right let's come down here next moves let's put all that together scan the grid from 0 0 to 8 8 looking for any positions that can be filled in automatically that is where there is only one possibility for what number goes there um, so I've kind of given you the hint that we're going to consider every position from 0 0 up to 8 8 so we're going to go um, 4 and let's use the 4 notation and we'll, let's say x is in um, 0 until uh, and sorry 1 no, no it is 0 sorry 0 until 9 y is in 0 until 9 and we only want the cases um, where those positions uh, can be f uh, can be um, done automatically and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say okay that, so that is so if I was just to say yield x y those would be my positions to start with I haven't done any of the filtering so positions is that let's now filter that positions dot filter 
And in this case, we want to filter it positively. We want to filter it um, so only to find the case where for that position, um, possibilities for that position in the grid is one. Possibilities for P grid um, dot size is one. OK, and now what's the the complaint said here? Index sequence of tuples doesn't equal. Uh, and so this this is the problem that I now want to get the value out of it. Well, I could say um, for position in those filtered positions. And what I would like you then to do is yield me that position goes to um, what its pos possibility f uh, for was, p grid. And I happen to know that there's only one of them. So let's just get that one out. That would work. That's starting to look a little bit ugly. That's starting to look a little bit ugly. What I might do, let's do a bit of a cheat. Up here in my for loop, um, I could, you know, I was using this notation here to do the map. What I could do, actually do is I could go possibilities equals, and so this is going to actually make it full of the sequence um, possibilities for of the uh, of the position x y in that grid. Uh, oops, why is that? Po cannot resolve. Uh, I've misspelt it. Possibilities for. OK, so possibilities is now a sequence. And what I want to do is I want to get the case where there is only one of them. And I would like to filter out the head of it. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to say P um, in those possibilities. But I'm now actually I'm going to filter on the case that there is only one possibility. I'm going to go filter uh, if possibilities dot size equals one. And so that is now going to extract my only possibility if possibility size is one. It's going to translate into an interesting sequence of uh, you know, maps, flat maps and filter knots. But I want you to kind of realize that we're getting every X out of there, every Y out of there. Um, we're working out what the possibilities are and we're getting the possibility out. But we're filtering out all of the cases where actually the array had more possibilities than that. And then I can say, well, yield that location goes to what my possibility was. And the reason I've now got an error is because saying val that equals it doesn't return it. So let's just knock that out and save it. And let's run my code. All six tests passed. So I'm now managing to recommend all of the kind of immediately obvious next moves in my Sudoku grid. And all of these bits of code, because of the way I've asked you to break it up, none of them are terribly long. They're all kind of, you know, five lines or less and hopefully relatively understandable. But you do have lots of choices. You've got loads of different ways you can present these things. You can do maps. You can do four notations. You can um, work out the positions and then do other stuff with them. Uh, so there, there, there's lots of different ways of presenting it. And sometimes the question that you will have to answer for yourself is what is the most understandable, the most uh, meaningful way to present my particular algorithm? So, for instance, you might look at this and go, ooh, that's a little bit convoluted and it's not necessarily ter terribly efficient um, because you're doing this map and then you're filtering. You're kind of, you know, you're mapping across all the possibilities and then cutting out an awful lot because you're then, you know, you're mapping across the sequence, even if there's more uh, more than one in there, but you're then filtering those ones out. Um, so, you know, they're, they're, they're a lot of the art of uh, being a good programmer is thinking about how to make my code readable to others, how to make it maintainable to others. 
Uh, one of the things I would say though is that having shorter functions helps. If your code all fits in this one screen and you can have a look at it and work out what it, what it does in that way, that is a lot easier to deal with than if you've got some long spaghetti thing that is going across um, many pages of code. All right, that's the, the, the solution for the tutorial this time. Um, worth remembering that we introduced um, in, this, uh, in this episode, if you like, we introduced fold left. And so up here, um, here we have uh, fold left introduced in this video.